Just a flesh wound. It's a liar! You can't handle the truth! Go ahead. Make my day. Say, all right, all right, all right. Always live in awe of the glorious mechanism of the human body. Okay, good morning, listeners. Um, today we are in for an absolute treat. Uh, I'm joined by one of my uh, clinical heroes and, and somebody that looks really, really up to. He's um, single-handedly changed the way that I um, approach back pain specifically and also my clinical skills in general as well. Um, today's guest is just going to be an absolute treat for everyone. I think if you're anything like me, grab a pen and, and, and a piece of paper and just write down everything you can and, and basically do what I'm going to do. And that's be a sponge um, and just absorb it all in. So our guest today is a distinguished professor emeritus at the University of Waterloo. As a professor for 30 years, his work has produced over 245 peer-reviewed scientific journal papers. He's authored five textbooks and has also been awarded numerous international awards, including most recently, the Order of Canada. Um, he continues as a chief scientific officer for Backford Pro, where he consults for low back pain patients and also works with some of the world's top athletes from various sports. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Stuart McGill. <laughs> good morning, Jordan. And uh, of course, it's nighttime for me. But uh, good morning to you, sir, in Perth. Um, so yeah. before before we start, I just wanted to sort of give you um, uh, quite a bit, bit of praise in terms of your um, online course, which I completed uh, at the end of last year. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed your course. It was fantastic in the fact that um, because there's so much information and it's so so uh, densely rich with with uh, such clinical pearls. It was really great to be able to actually go back during the online course and rewatch some of those videos. Some of them multiple times. I must have watched. Oh, I don't know. I can almost probably say it word for word some of the stuff you said because I would have watched it that many times. So I just wanted to give you a big thanks for for the online course. It was brilliant. <laughs> My wife sends her condolences having to listen to me, but uh, <laughs> well, I'm glad you uh, enjoyed it. I was so reluctant, Jordan, to put those courses online. Uh, I didn't really think people would learn in such a situation, but like yourself, they said, oh, we got to go back over the things that I went over a bit too quickly, which I can never predict who wants to hear things more than once. So they worked out well, there are 60 hours of listening to me demonstrate and play with patients and whatnot, as you know, and then there's the hands-on uh, skills development sessions as well uh, as an extra to uh, my lecturing. And in a million years, I never thought they would be successful either, but they uh, turned out, of course, we had to adapt our teaching and be much more visual and descriptive, but uh, the hands-on skill development worked out well. So anyway, thank you for the feedback. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, again, courses in person are great, but being able to wake up early in the morning before I went out to clinic or anything like that and catch a couple of hours was great. So it was really quite uh, useful how flexible it could be. Um, and obviously, like we said, going back is really, really good because, you know, your numerous, numerous years of, of work trying to condense that down to a couple of, of courses would be hard enough, but trying to, you know, absorb it as a, as a clinician going in there, I think it was really, really useful. Um, so moving on from there, I think we'll dive straight into, I'm trying to be respectful of your time, so we'll dive straight into the topics as well. So I thought we could start off with one of the big ones, we start off with the concept of spinal stability. So could you briefly sort of talk about, about the uh, spinal stability and then discuss and explain this concept and why it's fundamental for uh, function and also athleticism as well? Yes. Well, stability has a definition that is context specific. So uh, first of all, stability is akin to stiffness. So imagine a knee joint, for example. Um, if you strain or tear a knee ligament, you lose stiffness in the joint and you get micro movements or shear instability. And of course, as a clinician, you would do a drawer test and test that laxity or loss of stability and whether or not that was a pain driver. So we can start off with that concept uh, in spines. Stability is both a cause and a consequence of injury and pain. Isn't that interesting? It's both. So if we were to take, and you're familiar with the dynamic disc designs models, the uh, great artist, the owner, 
uh, who develops all of these, Jerome Fryer, took a lot of the initial uh, models from our work uh, at the university, and he captured in the most biofidelic way uh, what we were able to measure over the years. So just as a knee loses stability and stiffness uh, with injury, so do spinal joints. So consider this joint, L3-4 normal, and this joint, L5-S1 normal, but L4-5 has lost a bit of stiffness. Observe, I'm going to apply a torque back and forth, and you can see where the majority of the emotion occurs, where the joint has lost stiffness. If we turn around, you can see which facet joints are getting worked. Again, it's the joint. So not always, but almost always, if it's a non-traumatic injury, you will see the facets become clinical two or three years post disc injury. Very rarely is it a disc is is the disc secondary to facet damage. It does occur, but it's very rare. Um, nonetheless, there is the first tenant of spine stability. Injury causes instability uh, and pain. And then, if you uh, you could assess that through a frontal plane prone shear instability test, which is the drawer test for spines. You could do a frontal plane uh, bear hug kind of a, a stability test where you push their shoulders hooking down uh, and posting as the clinician and pulling the opposite iliac crest across and seeing if you can create the pain laterally. But the beauty of this, this style of provocative testing is immediately you can find the antidote. You could ask the person, try some abdominal bracing, stiffen the abdominal wall, allow the stiffness of the muscles, <clears throat> excuse me, make up for the joint loss of stiffness, arrest the micro movements, try the uh, offensive shear test once again, and, and quite often they say, oh, my pain is gone, or it's less. So there is the first type uh, of stability in the context of uh, injury. Um, the next one would be, I've got models for this if you wanna see it, but uh, the spine is a flexible rod. Uh, consider them as a stack of fruit. If we put a stack of oranges, one on top of the other, and put a book on top, most likely the oranges would fly apart. Uh, that's why we don't have ball and socket joints in our spine. We have discs. Discs add a natural stiffness. So they allow us to have reasonably modest musculature because if we had ball and socket joints, we need enormous musculature around those stacked ball and socket joints. I used to run an experiment at the university or in the classroom with fourth year spine students and I would get a stack of coffee cans and I'd put a tennis ball in between each one. And then I had four guy wires, which were ropes on each coffee can. And one student would be on one rope and I'd say, all right, flex the spine. And they couldn't do it. The whole thing was buckling and collapsing until I put a rubber ring around each one, simulating the annulus. And then all of a sudden they could start to coordinate movements. So that's the second context and tenant of stability the spine being a flexible rod is wonderful for dancing and tying your shoe. However, if you're going to pick up and suitcase carry your groceries, you better stiffen around that rod, otherwise it will buckle and collapse. If you're a power lifter, the supreme example of stiffness, they even put on an exosuit of stiff material to add even more uh, stiffness to allow it to bear load. So stability allows a broad range of activities possible for the spine. That's the second tenant. The third tenant has to do with linkage mechanics. Our skeleton, our body is a linkage. It follows the physical rules of linkage mechanics. The first one is proximal stiffness and control is required for distal athleticism. So if I wanna wiggle my finger really quickly, I had to stiffen my wrist. Distal athleticism, I had to stiffen proximally. If I wanted to wiggle my hand, I had to stiffen my elbow. Finally, if I wanted to pull a door, throw a punch or whatever, let's say I'm going to throw a punch, I'm going to use my pec major muscle, which crosses my shoulder, one joint. Distal to the ball and socket 
that uniarticular muscle creates the desired pushing athleticism. But look what it does proximally. It bends my rib cage towards. So there would be my effective push if all I used was my bench press pushing muscle. But if I lock down proximally, arrest the movement on the proximal side, which when we're measuring stability is an energy leak, we've lost energy. But when we lock down the proximal side, 100% of pec major is now expressed distally for the uh, athleticism. So I can't even walk. If you go to the uh, neurology ward at the children's hospital, and let's say you find a little 10-year-old girl with a paralyzed quadratus lumborum, a primary frontal plane stabilizer. Let's say her right QL is paralyzed. She can step with her right leg, plant, and lift her left leg for left leg swing. When she plants her left leg, the right pelvis now in leg swing collapses. Quadratus lumborum is there to hold it up. Proximal stability. If you don't have it, you can't walk very well. If you're a rugby player in Australia, if you're underpowered for core stability, say they're running in the pitch, they plant their left foot, cut and turn. And then we find why do they get pain only during those high speed turns? It's because they lack frontal plane training. And as they plant the left leg and cut the right leg, to, the right pelvis just drops a little bit, tweaking uh, whatever the sensitized tissue happens to be. But uh, again, very context specific, but there are three basic contexts for uh, stability. And we can go into others for combative athletes and protecting internal organs and all that kind of thing. But the big three for allowing movement and athleticism and dealing with this notion of stability being both a cause and a consequence of injury and pain, those are the three big ones. Sorry, that's a long answer, but that was a huge question that you just answered or yeah. asked, pardon me. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I mean, that's just massive. And, and, you know, there's so much in there. It's, it's, it's brilliant the way that you sort of applied it to those three principles as well. And I mean, I know I, a lot of the time I say in clinic to, to patients, a great analogy, I'm a big one for analogies and, and, you know, you can't shoot a cannon out of a, out of a canoe. Um, so you need to create that stiffness in order for you to do, like you said, anything, move your finger, throw a ball, um, cut in, 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 in rugby on the field, all of that applies to that, that stability. So that really does um, cover quite a bit of it as well. Um, and yeah. I guess following, following on from that as well, the next question would be, I he heard you often t talk about um, the biological tipping point. Um, so it's basically an overarching principle that governs the body. Um, we talk about it often in clinic, not just in the spine or uh, related to back pain, but I guess it could be applied to basically every injury that happens to the body where we call it load versus capacity. So could you just explain a little bit about the biological tipping point and how this principle applies to injury rehab as well as also performance? Yes. Let me go one level higher to start the framework. Every biological system as a tipping point. Let's take a nutritional one because everyone understands that. Let's take vitamin D as a variable and it's a determinant of health. If you do not have enough vitamin D, you're deficient and you're sick. So you increase the vitamin D exposure either through nutritional supplements or you get out into the sun or whatever the case is to the optimum level and you now experience optimal health in terms of vitamin D. If you go past that optimum level, you now become poisoned and sick with vitamin D. In other words, there's an optimum level. That is the tipping point. The language of cells is mechanics, it's force. It's how they communicate with one another. It's how you uh, strengthen bone, strengthen muscle, cause adaptations. It's how you regulate blood sugar. It's all of these systems uh, in your body, all governed by tipping points. More is not better. Unfortunately, in today's society, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, someone will show me a posting on social media and this poor young person will say, 
oh, on my day off, I just banged out 5K on a run and that was my day off. And I think um, we'll be seeing you in the orthopedic <laughs> clinic when you're 50 because you train to adapt. You adapt after the training is finished. And there are some people who just build cumulative micro trauma, not realizing it, because they never give themselves the rest uh, for adaptation. And as you know, different parts of your body need different adaptation schedules. Bone, for example, is a four or five day turnover. So strong men training, doing deadlifts and heavy squats and whatnot should probably, well, in real practice, what they do is they have a heavy squat day and they don't do it again for, for another five days or so. It's how you produce the grand old men and women of, of powerlifting and strongman. The bodybuilder trains three days a week. We had a patient here earlier in the week and he said, well, I train every day. And, and my brain is, what are you thinking every day? You just tear your body down. When do, well, why are you training? <laughs> what are you trying to adapt? He had no concept of a tipping point and what he was really trying to accomplish. So that's the, uh, the tipping point. And when you can understand that, your training goal is to manipulate the, the, the tipping point, expand the capacity underneath the tipping point and uh, avoid crossing it. And as you age, that tipping point will naturally decrease. So you have to recognize that. And uh, the tipping point uh, really governs your health so much. If you want an example, you see I've got a little bit of white hair now and I'm retired. And when I was your age, I was all about strength. I didn't need mobility. I had lots of mobility. I wanted to be strong. And that's the way I trained. I can't train that way now. I'd break myself. So with my injury history or any older person's injury history and the way that they are now functioning biologically, uh, I don't worry about load anymore. I worry about the movement and uh, the range of motion. And uh, I mean, I tell you now, I, I have zero pain. <laughs> I feel fabulous. Uh, I still split all my firewood and, and all the rest of it. But anyway, there's a bit of a discussion of a tipping point. It needs more context if we're going to talk about who, what their injury history is, what their... Uh, anatomy is their biomechanics absolutely um i, I don't know if you're aware of uh, dr shona helson who's sort of a uh, expert in recovery if you will um, particularly in australia she's worked with some of the top athletes from around the world and also um, with the olympic athletes from australia as well and a great quote that she always says is the training you benefit from is the training you're recovering from and i think that's so um so eloquent and, and sort of sums it up as you're saying that you know training is not where you get stronger it's the training that creates a stimulus which then when with you put recovery creates the adaption and that's where you where you actually improve from there as well so it's a bit of a i guess a balancing act between you know staying under that tipping point where you you're pushing your body enough to actually stoke the fire if you will to create an adaption but then giving your body enough time to actually cement that adaption yeah, the only time you, you should really cross the tipping point is in competition. And you can go past the tipping point for a brief period of time. But once again, after you've finished the competition, you've earned a few, uh, an appropriate rest. You know, there's the great power lifter, Ed Cohn. Uh, many people refer to him as the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And Ed had a rule. He lasted many years. He only set one personal best or maybe two per year. And when he set a personal best, it took so much out of his body, he rested and let his body adapt. He set record after record after record. And again, you know, you see some of these people going to some gyms and they post their personal best on the blackboard and they keep trying to better it every few weeks. And uh, again, I, I suppose it's good business for you, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not the way to uh, uh, 
create a sustainable uh, athleticism. Um, and sort of moving on from that, as you said, creating a little bit more, I guess, context specific, if we could sort of branch off into more specific injuries and conditions, um, something that we commonly see, probably the most common um, back related injury that we see in clinic is disc injury or discogenic back pain. So if you could, could you speak about sort of the anatomy of, of the disc and how disc injuries occur, sort of the mechanism behind them? So the disc uh, obviously is not a ball and socket joint. There's a disc, which is a concentric ring architecture of collagen fibers. The collagen fibers are held together with a gooey stuff called ground substance. The middle of the disc is a gel, and it is an incompressible hydraulic fluid. There it is. And if you have, so I said the collagen forms a fabric. It's a biological adaptable fabric. My shirt is a fabric too. My beautiful Alico lifting jacket. <laughs> I'll, I'll put a word in for one of the sponsors of BackFit Pro <laughs> here. If I wanted to work the fibers loose and create a hole in my jacket, I'd create stress strain reversals back and forth and the weave would delaminate and open up. That's what people do when they start treating their spines like ball and socket joints. The collagen fibers with motion plus load, you need both. If I, if I did cat camel or, or uh, Middle Eastern belly dancing all day long, we've never measured any uh, issues with that. The problem is when you take the spine through the range of motion under load, that's when the delamination stresses occur. And there has been a little bit of a delamination through the collagen here. So when I pressurize the nucleus, I can work the gel through the delamination and you will, there it is. Do you see the bubble starting to come up yeah, now yeah, we can as see the yeah. nucleus works its way uh, through? So there is a fabric and I'm just going to, uh, everyone can see the weave. If I do some stress strain reversals, you can start to see how already I started to delaminate the uh, fabric. So if we then go to a, uh, another one of uh, Dynamic Disc Design's brilliant models, you can see the gel down inside the nucleus. And if we look around posteriorly, you will see a delamination that has occurred. At the end of my finger right there, can you see a little bit of a red mark? Yep. That is a delamination. So now I'm going to squeeze the spine and bend it forward, which puts hydraulic effort posteriorly through the delamination. And then we can see the disc bulge starting. Yeah. I have a friend who's a radiologist who has one of these in his neck, and he does this for about 15 minutes, we take an MRI picture. There's the nice juicy disc bulge. He goes the other way and I'll pull a little bit of a vacuuming traction on his neck. 15 minutes later, it's gone. <laughs> so there are certain disc bulges that we can have almost a spontaneous resolution with the right amount of mechanical knowledge, uh, the disc shape, for example, uh, the more lima con or the more it's shaped like a lima bond, been, the easier it is to get uh, resolution of the disc bulge. But then this is what happens. The next time the person bends forward, uh, either performing a poor uh, form squat in the gym, or they might, be, some people are even just tying their shoe, or they might sneeze and cause the disc bulge to grow. Um, bending forward, and you can see the bulge growing. Now, this time I'm going to apply the mechanical antidote. We're going to stack the spine and I'm going to bend forward through the hips. You can take a lot of compression now and I'm just gonna compress. Notice nothing comes out of the delamination. You have to bend forward and drive the hydraulic effort posteriorly with posture. So posture is key in that type of uh, disc bulge. So that's one way, uh, almost always associated with lifting poorly. If we had a uh, very flexible athlete, say someone like a yoga practitioner and they didn't lift weights, interesting, when they bend forward, their disc bulge is anterior. 
or to get a posterior bulge, they have to arch backwards. So it's the opposite response because their discs have adapted great flexibility and they're not delaminated. So do you see how, again, how the disc was adapted by its owner determines uh, the disc bulge and the disc damage. Another pathway though, is through the top and bottom of the disc. Consider the vertebra as a barrel. And the top and bottom of the barrel is a cartilaginous end plate. It's not bone as people think. So now I'm going to squeeze this specimen, pressurize the nucleus inside the disc, and now we've cut the top of, uh, the, cut the vertebra off, but notice how the end plate squeezes up into the vertebral body. And the vertebral body is not solid bone, it's spongy bone, cancellous bone. And those struts or trabeculae of bone have a spring, uh, a leaf spring action to them. But they, the, this, this uh, breach in the cartilaginous uh, end plate allows the nucleus to come through and push into breaking some of the struts and that's called the Schmorl's node. Uh, or, and the inflammation response to the immune system seeing the nucleus come through into the blood for the first time because the nucleus is, is avascular, doesn't have blood supply. But as that uh, nuclear material comes up into the bloody environment, it sets off a massive inflammatory response. And then you see the modic changes on MRI, which is uh, inflammation inside the bone. And it feels like a bone pain. So when the person says, oh, I've got, they can put their finger on it right there. I've, I've got um, uh, just a central boring pain. And I'll say, good, grab the stool pull up on the stool, add some compressive load, and I'll say, that's what really triggers my pain. So now we're suspecting a, uh, uh, an end plate fracture. Uh, when you let a little air out of your car tire, it bulges on the road. And the car is also a little bit sloppy. Uh, that's what happens when you get an end plate fracture. The whole disc bulges now, and it's not a focal disc bulge, which I've been talking about up until this point. It's a broad-based bulge because the whole joint is now flatter and the disc just bulges everywhere. Not only does it bulge outward, but it bulges inwards as well. And over the longer term, that may be a bit more of a problematic uh, clinical situation. Anyway, there's a little bit of a start uh, or essay on uh, disc injuries. Yeah, again, so so rich, there's so much in that. And I think it's great to actually, you know, be able to visualize it, which is why um, I'm a big fan of, of those uh, dynamic disc designs as well. I think, you know, we'll touch on it a little bit later, but being able to actually educate patients on that so they actually, you know, know their mechanism um, is so empowering. Um, and I think it's huge as well to go on that. Um, just following on from, from, from those disc injuries, does that disc injury, if it loses, as you say, like a, a car's tire sort of depressurized, is that what can result in micro instability? I know you sort of mentioned that early on. Yes. Is that what we see happening can, with it? It certainly can do, yes. And so sometimes yes and sometimes no. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> as you know, it could lead it could lead to an anterior Liz thesis or a posterior Liz thesis and uh, kink the spinal cord and the cauda equina and all kinds of things. So it 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 really sets off a whole possible cascade scenarios. Right, and I think a, a real. Um... A point that needs to be highlighted as well as you said you know when you're working those fibers apart so it's more of a delamination those fibers actually spread apart as opposed to completely rupturing is that is that correct very rarely do you see ruptured collagen when you do see ruptured collagen it's not that the collagen was torn in the middle i have seen it in some extreme twist injuries but it's extremely rare um when we see collagen that is disrupted. It's usually uh, the collagen fibers connect to what are called Sharpies fibers, and that's what goes into the bone of the vertebra. And we've seen where the bone breaks and rips out the Sharpies fibers, and now the uh, that section of the collagen 
actually is only connected at one end. So the fibers didn't tear. They ruptured out of the bone that they were connected to at their end point. Wow. Yeah, that sounds pretty brutal. That's for sure. Um, yeah, well, that, that is uh, usually in heavy, heavy compressive injury where you're, you're, you're fracturing the bone and the end plate and the growth plate. You, you see it much more often in elderly and the adolescent spine. Um, and so building on from, from that uh, micro instability or micro movements as we see there, um, this theory of atherogenic or neuromuscular inhibition is a very interesting and fascinating uh, principle to me as well. Um, now that I've sort of, as we said, earlier I've gone through a lot of the studies on it and reading a lot of research around it. I'm starting to pick it up quite a bit more in my low back patients, particularly those who've had um, low back pain ongoing for quite a time. Could you sort of explain this principle of neuromuscular inhibition and how it applies to, to low back pain? The first I had really been exposed to it was from the work of Vladimir Yonda, who is the Czechoslovakian neurologist and a student of uh, Carol Levitt. Yonda proposed this reaction in not everyone, but in quite a number of people with chronic low back pain. The back pain inhibits the gluteal muscles of the hip and it facilitates the hip flexors. So on one side, you've got overactivation, so we, shall we say. Now he called that having a tight muscle in the hip flexors. And the, the sign of it was the person got out of a chair and they would have to walk their hands up their thighs and slowly pull their hips through because of their perceived tightness. So that was facilitation of the hip flexors. And the gluteal muscles became inhibited. So you've got several options to extend the hip. You can use the gluteal muscles or you can use the hamstrings. And he had various tests to show that when the person extended, they would do it with their hamstrings rather than their gluteal muscles. Well, of course, if you don't have gluteal muscles, uh, that puts extra load on both the back and the hip if you go through the mechanics of that. And, and probably the best work on that would be Kara Lewis and uh, Shirley Sarman out of uh, St. Louis. But going back to Yonda's neurological reaction to pain, uh, he didn't have electromyography in the techniques to confirm or refute this, but it was his clinical observation. And he was sort of like Einstein in a way in that he had many predictions and understandings of uh, various pathologies throughout the body, but not always the equipment to uh, prove it. Um, so we, we did have electromyography at the university and I believe we were the first to measure uh, this phenomenon. So we took a group of people who were candidates for hip replacement in about five years, but they were still working, firemen, policemen, uh, the trades. Um, they had an arthritic hip, but it wasn't just bad enough yet to uh, replace. So there was an interventional radiologist at one of our hospitals where he would do a therapeutic arthrogram. He would pump a saline fluid into the joint capsule of the hip, that hurts. I've had it. <laughs> I've had it in my shoulder and in my uh, uh, hip. And uh, it bursts the capsule, expands it just a little bit. Um, and uh, while we're, so first of all, we measured the people walking, doing back bridges, ex lifting the hips up off the floor where they should be engaging the gluteals, that would be a very healthy response. When we gave them hip pain, they didn't use their gluteals near as much. They became very, very hamstring dominant. And then when the pain went away, the neurology returned. So it was the first uh, inkling that Yonda was right. Now, not in everybody, but a lot of people. So it causes people to limp. Uh, if you have uh, knee pain and you're anticipating it, the brain inhibits certain muscles and you, you, you limp. So it makes good sense. Um, now, the other side of the Yonda crossed pelvis syndrome, as he called it, was a neurological facilitation of the hip flexors. Well, as it turned out, it wasn't the hip flexors 
those candidates being rectus femoris, uh, the high quadricep, uh, uh, iliacus, and psoas. So we put intramuscular electrodes into psoas. I was one of the first guys ever in, in the world to have my psoas implanted with an electrode to see what challenges, hip flexion, spine stability, whatever, when does the brain go and get the uh, psoas muscle? But anyway, it turned out it was just to the psoas muscle, this facilitation. Well, people can do hip flexor stretches in the clinic. They might grab their ankle and do all kinds of stretches for the hip flexors. That might stretch the hip flexors. It does nothing for the psoas. You can palpate the psoas. So there is rectus femoris. There's my inguinal crease. I'm going to drift my fingers just into the medial little notch, the iliopectineal notch. And now I can go into a lunge position and I can feel my psoas tendon now and it's not tight. But if I descend a little bit more and then I push my arm overhead and I reach for the ceiling, now all of a sudden I can start to feel psoas becoming stretched because I'm bending my spine. Psoas comes all the way up the spine, up all the transverse processes to the diaphragm at T12. And then I drop my shoulder back. Now all of a sudden, psoas becomes active. And now I'm going to spin my hand around into internal shoulder rotation, external shoulder rotation, playing with the anterior chain fascia. And in some people that causes tremendous psoas tightness and that will uh, release it. So boy, what a lot of examination I just did to determine, is it psoas? And if so, I just found a very specific stretch for the psoas muscle, but it only begins there because the psoas, as we've learned so much from the work of uh, brilliant people like uh, Thomas Meyer, for example, following these anatomical trains, uh, connecting many groups of muscles and slings throughout the body that I can now stretch my psoas depending on where my hand is over my head. And uh, as I said, some people, it uh, induces a lot of tightness and pain and uh, sometimes it takes it away, but that's the first stretch that has been able to alleviate the neurogenic facilitation of their psoas, it's not their hip flexors. So we learned so much from Yonda, but as is often the case, a little bit more refinement and investigation of the phenomenon takes us to better clinical understanding and better clinical tools to help these people suffering from those very specific uh, types of uh, neurological reactions to pain. Sorry, I, I get wound up and I talk too much. That That's again, probably, or too long and disorganized, no, 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 but not at I, all. I hope you got it. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. Uh, the more, the, the better, as I said, just going to be a sponge and try and absorb it all. So as I was going down there, I was just writing, jotting some things down as well. Um, but following on from that, is it, is it, you know, to, in order to address that, we're not only stretching the psoas as well, but it's also getting some more facilitation of the actual glutes or the, or the muscles that have been um, inhibited. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. We tested different techniques to reintegrate the sleepy gluteals. I, I used to use the word gluteal amnesia. Some people thought that was very funny. And there would be clinicians who would take a med ball and they'd use uh, some techniques where they'd say, well, let's go around the clock. I'm going to uh, flex with the med ball and then I'm going to extend to six o'clock, five o'clock, four o'clock and go around the clock with this ball saying this would activate the gluteals. Well, we took some gluteal inhibited people and we tried those. It didn't, uh, they were hamstring dominant before the uh, 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 exercise and they were hamstring dominant afterwards. It didn't re-educate the brain. And with Yonda's exercises, we would do, uh, we'd have the uh, client lay on their back and then they would create sequences to activate the quadriceps uh, by pushing through knee extension 
and then doing a back bridge, mentally thinking of activating the gluteals. And then we would monitor the uh, co-contraction of uh, hamstrings and through proper coaching. And this was all Yonda's techniques that we would coach. That was the most effective way out of all of them that we measured for re-educating the engram, which is the, uh, the, 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 the collection of signals for hip extension, where prior the, the glutes were missing in the program, but to re-educate the program and do it enough times that you've created a new muscle memory, a new engram, where the gluteals are now uh, dominant once again. Now, there are some athletes, for example, that don't really use much gluteals at all. They are very hamstring dominant and, and a bike cyclist would be one of them. Massive hamstrings, quadriceps, not much glute. And it's very difficult to re-educate those people because of the strong engram that they've developed with the uh, cycling. But for most people who don't cycle, it's not that difficult to create the um, more normal engram uh, post, post pain if they've been uh, gluteally inhibited. Fantastic. And I guess, you know, uh, there's so much there again. Um, there's just so many clinical pills. It's, 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 it's fantastic, but it goes back again to identifying the right cause, doesn't it? I mean, you know, if it's just purely a tight muscle, um, stretching may be beneficial, but it's understanding the whole context to it that, you know, that's almost a consequence of what else is going on from there. And then applying the right, uh, the right, you know, fix to the right cause is, is going to get you the most uh, benefit. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I did a, uh, a lecture this morning and uh, my point was everybody is different. Uh, you can't train a, a St. Bernard to win at the Greyhound track, even though they're both dogs and you will never get a Greyhound to carry the loads up a snowy mountainside the way a uh, St. Bernard can. And people uh, fall into the same uh, category. So what uh, works for some people who have a very dominant fascial train. They're very elastic people. These are the people who throw javelins and uh, high jump and, and uh, th that kind of thing. Um, but they're not the power lifters who take all of the elastic uh, uh, in that sense away and uh, to, to create stiffness and load bearing ability. So, uh, you know, these conversations always require a context. Uh, Absolutely. To, to be consumable and un unfortunately in this day of social media and, and two or three sentences to explain your point, um, it, it, the context is often missing and it causes so much unnecessary uh division i suppose for sure and and you know it's it's uh fantastic you've almost done my job for me then in the fact that you highlighted you know how a saint bernard versus a greyhound is so different um and that's a great segue so i appreciate you uh touching on that point and i Basically, the question behind that is specific populations and occupations. So being an OT, we think of occupations as basically activities that are meaningful to people. Um, we tend to see a lot of, I think your words are clusters of, of people or clusters of conditions related to their activities that they do. So could you touch on that and, and I guess speak about, you know, common condition that you would see in a gymnast versus, you know, a golfer versus a, a power athlete as well? Different sports create unique loads, motions, postures, engrams. They attract specific and like body types, uh, et cetera. You, you, you're not gonna find an MBA center uh, working out with the jockeys at the, the horse race track as, as the extreme example there. So it's the chronic stresses that lead to very specific conditions. So if I took uh, another one of uh, Jerome's fabulous dynamic disc designs, here is a uh, specimen with a bilateral fracture of the pars. You can see the pars is broken right there. And how does that happen? It occurs, you see the facet joints moving past one another, creating stress strain reversals. 
gymnasts, if, if I said to you, who has spondylolis thesis, you would say gymnasts, dancers, and up until a few years ago in Australia, we would say fast bowlers and cricket as well. Uh, but that's another story. But the stress strain reversals of the pars bone, full range flexion through to full range extension, uh, you see it in gymnastics, uh, et cetera, over and over and over again, a stress crack forms at the bottom of the pars. And if you keep up the offense, the stress crack continues with more cumulative trauma until it breaks all the way through bilaterally, it breaks off and now they've lost contact with the whole spinous process and the superior vertebra often slips forward like this on the uh, inferior. So it is a cumulative trauma fracture and uh, uh, injury. Well, as I said, this was, uh, there was a study done in Australia with state level fast bowlers in cricket. So the professional cricket bowlers, do you know every single one had a pars, now they use the word defect. They had a bloody fracture <laughs> somewhere in their spine in, in one of their pars. Um, there was a, an Australian orthopedic surgeon, Phil Hardcastle, who noticed all of this and was influential in changing policy in Australia. Cricket bowlers are only allowed to bowl so many bowls cumulatively a day and cumulatively per week. In other words, the state limited the physical exposure. Now, it's not all that common that you will see these pars fractures in the cricketers. So it was one of the most successful public health policy interventions ever. <laughs> and, you know, there are some people who say, oh, well, motions don't matter, postures don't matter, and, and uh, I don't know. But nonetheless, uh, th there you go, uh, uh, of an example of a stress peculiar to a specific group leading to a very specific type of crossing the tipping point. We've already been there and uh, them getting a very specific type of orthopedic uh, issue. We know the mechanism. I've given you an example of an intervention that turned out to be uh, extremely uh, uh, useful and, and good, efficacious. Sure, it's it's uh, my my cousin actually was a fast bowler, played state level as well here in in, in Western Australia, and um, he unfortunately suffered a stretch a stretch fracture of his lower back, and it's because he was you know a fast bowler. This was quite a few years ago now, but you know repeated extension as they're going through high forces, um, and and that really impacted on his um, career unfortunately as well. How is he now? Is the legacy still there, or has he stabilized? And that's the right use of the word. Has he stabilized the joint so he's enjoying a good life now? Yes, no, he's uh, eased off on the, on the cricket um, and been a little bit more paying attention to his recovery, um, which has really benefited him. So he's all good. He doesn't have any pain or any issues at all now. He's not doing cricket as much as I said, but yeah, he's completely all, all free and his body has adapted. We all get old too soon and smart too late. <laughs> exactly. You learn. I, I think, I mean, you, you've touched on it before, but pain is a great levelizer, right? We, we, you know, it's very hard to convince people who don't have an injury or don't have a pain to change their way to protect themselves from the future. And as we know, prevention is better than a cure, but yeah, it's very hard to convince people of that. Oh, I'm, I'm an idiot to many young people. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it's funny how after a back injury, all of a sudden, uh, I've become a little bit smarter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's fantastic. And, and, and um, I guess touching on that as well, golfers tend to be, I see quite a lot of golfers being a um, weekend hacker myself. Um, golf is quite a, quite a, I guess, a bit challenging uh, one to understand because I think you know, over the last five or 10 years, uh, we've started to correct the ship a little bit. But if we go back to the early 2000s to the mid 2010s, we saw a lot of golfers starting to, um, and I won't name specific names, but starting to really change their, their programming and their training to train very, very heavy, heavy deadlifts, heavy uh, squats. Um, and I think that, you know, goes again to relating it to the activity and the goal that you have. Um, could you just quickly touch on golfers and why, you know, possibly heavy training and heavy lifting may not be as beneficial for them? 
Well, we, we, we certainly went through that era where some very high profile uh, golfers had some brilliant flame outs and uh, they were doing things like Olympic lifting and thinking that getting stronger and fitter would uh, somehow increase the length of their drive and all the rest of it. Interestingly, not, I'm not aware of any of them who in increased the length of their drives that much. P professional golf is a game of precision. And those who don't drive as far on the, off the tee, they make up for it on the second um, uh, shot. And uh, quite often they will shorten up on the initial drive to get a better strategy for the second shot, make the second shot longer, and then they're closer to the pin for the third shot. But uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, Olympic lifting stressed their knees and their hips. And for golf, it's about having mobile hips. Um, you know, the turner uh, in, in golf, if they can turn around the hips, then they get a lovely uh, X factor, storage and recovery of elastic energy, uh, all the rest of it. So, you know, you can, you, you can see in, in golf, there are those who are the turners, there are those who are the twisters, and they don't have the uh, uh, hip mobility. But nonetheless, a golfer, when you measure the great ones are not strong. In fact, uh, the great golfers, I've measured some of the top ones, they don't get close to expressing strength. We might see a pulse of about 60% of maximum just for a few microseconds, just to start the uncorking of the elastic energy. And then the big pulse usually occurs just at ball compact or a microsecond before. And it's at that point they stiffen and then they loosen up once again for the follow through. And you'll see some golfers, for example, actually jump at the time of impact. And others uh, are rotators and they rip the spikes in, uh, in the ground as they externally rotate, bam! And then that pulls the energy out of the bent golf shaft, causes the shaft to kick, and then uh, really whip the ball. They're, they're trying to create a whip with their, their body. But um, my, my point is they don't use that kind of strength athleticism. When a muscle contracts, it creates force and stiffness. If you use too much muscle, you don't hit the golf ball very far. You've just got stiff and slowed down. And I see it in many sports. I've measured some of the great uh, punchers and arm strikers and boxing and MMA. The guys with the bigger muscles push their punches rather than the fellas who are terrific knockout artists. And they're, they're more modest in their appearance, but they have this beautiful neurology. They turn the hips and then snap and then pulse and they're hitting you with that neurological stone. They've created great effective mass through their body by turning stiffened at that point. The great golfers somewhat have the same kind of uh, thing at ball contact, a little bit more effective mass to kick the club and uh, really bore the ball as the golf biomechanists will, uh, will describe. Anyway, uh, the yeah, golf I've... community has learned and for the most part now they're much more modest in the weight training uh for golf uh, we have a whole series on it's called the new science of golf where we show the data that we've measured some people who can really hit a ball a long way and um it's strategic pulsing of a very modest magnitude to create the whip through the through the body fantastic well i think that's a great uh, great one for all us weekend warrior golfers out there that we don't have to you know go into the gym and lift super super heavy um so yeah you heard it here first on well the podcast <laughs> you'll slow yourself down and you'll reduce your resilience for golf absolutely and and i know um obviously being aware of your work as well it goes along the lines of you know why you don't see 
I guess, powerlifters out there on, on, on the PGA, because it's not just, you know, muscle mass and creating through there. It's that pulsing, as you said, that really um, allows you to transfer that, that energy and, and, and release it at the right time. Um, and I guess also as well, building on from that, the radial st stiffness um, and the radial size of, of a cylinder, um, I know you've touched on it before, but if you could just quickly give in, in a couple of sentences about how a, a uh, cylinder is, is the product of its, of its um, size and what that relates to in terms of being quite flexible versus being quite stable. I'm going to need about five sentences. <laughs> you can, bye bye. I, I can't do it. I can't do it in a couple of sentences. <laughs> okay, let's count the sentences. Okay. A thin willow branch you can bend back and forth many times with no stress because the stress in a rod is a function of its thickness. Sentence one. Sentence number two. A thicker branch of wood, when you bend it to the same level, one repetition, it will shatter because the surface tensions are what give it resistance to bending. So the convex side goes into uh, tension and the convex side goes into compression. It will shatter right away. So now we go right back to that thought that is the person a St. Bernard or are they a greyhound? A slender spined person has great capacity to twist and bend the spine, load elastic energy into it and recover like an elastic band. A thicker spined person would gain far too much stress. And uh, if they don't have the ability to turn in the hips, they will never ever be able to be A, a resilient golfer and B, be able to hit very, uh, uh, very far. Brilliant. Well, from my from my accounts, that's six uh, sentences, but you you summarized it so beautifully there as well. Um, changing <laughs> changing tact a little bit, uh, if we could talk about the role of imaging as well in relation to low back pain. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, discussion, if we can put it out there, quite uh, being quite generous around the fact that imaging doesn't have any relation to to pain in general, not, not only just low back pain. But if we could talk about when back pain imaging or, or, or MRIs, x-rays are use, useful. Um, and also discussing how, I, I don't know if it was you or another, um, another podcast I was listening to, labeled it morphology versus pathology. Morphology being how, how the body changes and adapts, uh, adapts to over time versus pathology being something actively um, that we can see that's causing pain. Well, I'm sympathetic to all of those notions that you put forth. An MRI image, a CT image, an X-ray are simply pictures. You can take a look at my face. You will see uh, wrinkles. You will see scars. Now, if I had a fresh cut with blood coming out of it and I said, oh, that hurts, we would assume that that fresh wound is the source of pain. But the other scars are old. There's no pain there but the MRI image captures it all. You see the whole lifetime experience here. When we take a picture of someone's insides, we're looking at their entire life. We don't know whether it's a wound and causing pain or an old scar. So I don't think radiologists should write reports and, and this, is, this will get a few people angry. They don't, I don't think they can comment about back pain because they never assessed the person. When we assess a person, I know a good proportion of the time what I'm going to see on the MRI. Um, and I even know what to look for. If I find we're doing some neurodynamic tests and we, we pull the nerve a certain way and that replicates their pain, we pull it the other way and it doesn't, then uh, I pull from both ends and it doesn't cause pain. A little migration on one end, it does. I know there's something hanging up the nerve in the middle. I know exactly where to look and I know I'm either going to find some arthritic bone on the nerve. I might find a perineural cyst on the bone, but I'm going to find something that's hanging it up. So uh, once you assess the person and have gained a context for wounds and scars, plus a good idea now of what the candidate pain generators are, 
Scans can be incredibly powerful. They can unlock why that person has pain and all the other clinicians that they've seen have uh, failed. So I would never go along with this idea, but I know I get the sympathy when uh, everybody has back pain and it brings in an MRI. Uh, it's, it's not needed. They're, they're nowhere close to needing an MR with some fresh back pain. Uh, but in my world, I don't see, oh, J Joe has back pain. He'll run off to see McGill. I, I don't see people like that. All the people I've seen are referred by clinicians because they've failed. So I have to be more investigative and more thorough. The imaging is a big deal to me. So uh, there, uh, I, I see the, the, the controversy, but uh, no, imaging's important when you have context. Exactly. Uh, that's the key point. I say often all the time, especially to my patients as well, that I truly believe that that um, radiologists have the hardest hardest job in medicine. I mean, they don't they don't get to see you. They don't get to ask you any questions. They're just given these still images, as you're saying, um, and they've got a report on on what they see. Um, and obviously, you know, medical legal, they want to cover them themselves and cover bases. So they may pick up on stuff that was 20 years ago that, as you said, is a scar no longer causing causing pain. But they still have to report on that in case, you know, it may be maybe a generator. But because they don't see you, I honestly think they've got the hardest job because you've got to be able to, as you said, you know, assess the person and then look at the imaging and put the two together. And that's where you get the best benefit. Well, I know in certain cases, a person comes in and they don't fit the tests. Something is odd. It's not mechanical pain. Would you go and get an MRI? And we've found people with uh, aortic aneurysms, cancerous tumors, all kinds of things that save their life. But we knew from the exam that something isn't fitting. And uh, it was the scan that revealed uh, what that thing was. And as I said, it saved their life. So uh, anyway, it's all context, isn't it? A hundred percent. So talking about context, um, surgery, uh, the next topic that I wanted to touch on as well. Um, Surgery is, a, a, again, a bit of a controversial topic um, that's been discussed at, at length on, on many other um, occasions as well. What is your view on surgery? Is it required? Um, and I know you've uh, often spoken about giving your patients, as you, I think, term it virtual surgery. Um, do you think it's more likely the forced rest and rehab compliance that is almost enforced on the patient when they have surgery that are actually making the improvements? Um, what, do you, what is your take on surgery? Well, I need a person in front of me to give context to the discussion. So since we don't have that, I'll be very clear, surgery is absolutely necessary. Uh, if someone has been uh, quite traumatized uh, physically and they need bolting and screwing back together, that's the time, uh, th there's no option there. Or a really nasty nerve entrapment or compromise uh, that... Uh, you know, a really good attempt with good neurodynamics, uh, et cetera, has failed. Uh, tumors, neurological cysts, all of these things uh, are, are uh, surgical discussions. Very rarely do I throw my hands in the air and say surgery for back pain. Radiating pain emanating from the spine, we can begin that discussion, but, but really very, very rarely is, uh, is it just simply uh, back pain. Now we can have the conversation of virtual surgery. I know that uh, surgery, when it does work, often works because it's forced rest. So let me give a scenario. Um, let's take an exercise addict. A person comes in to see you in the clinic and they're a young mother, two kids at home, and their release is to go to the gym every day, ride the elliptical for 30 minutes and run on the treadmill for another 30. And they'll tell you, I have to do this for my mental health. And if I don't, I'm going to murder my kids and my husband and all the rest of it. And uh, you have zero chance of changing her behavior and therefore zero chance of getting her back pain better. 
you can say, well, I know it's causing your back pain. I've just measured it. It is that elliptical that's causing your spine to do this for half an hour a day. And as long as you keep doing that, it will not get better. There's nothing I can uh, say beyond that. And uh, I'll say, but I'll make you a deal. Uh, you can go and have your surgery now, or we can try virtual surgery. And then I'm quite traumatic. I'll touch her on the shoulder as if I'm knighting her. And I'll say, there's your surgery. Now, are you going to go to the gym tomorrow if you've just had surgery? And for the first time, they say, no. Uh, we're going to recover progressively, uh, slowly expose them to various uh, physical stressors, allow their body to slowly adapt. And that in of itself, um, we've done this, Jordan, uh, when uh, we measured the outcome of every patient we ever saw at the experimental research uh, clinic at the university. I know who got better. I know who didn't. I know who complied. I know who got virtual surgery and who didn't, who followed the, pro the progressions in back mechanic, uh, my book for the lay public. 95%, and this is a statistic that we measured, of those people who were told Surge, you've tried everything. It's all failed. The last thing for you is surgery. If the person was in that category and we gave them virtual surgery and they recovered following the back mechanic book, 95% after two years said, we never got surgery and we're glad that we never did. So there's a statistic that I can uh, stand by. But, you know, there, there, there's no question. I'm so glad. Uh, there's some good spine surgeons around and, uh, you know, I just think of where I would be myself. Uh, I've never had spine surgery, but I've had hip replacement and a few other things. And I would be in a wheelchair if it wasn't for my surgical colleagues. So, you know, there's certainly a time and a place. Fantastic. And again, it comes back to the context is key, right? It, it depends, um, is, is overarching yeah. through everything that we discuss. Um, and I guess yeah. going on from that point as well, going to be trying to try and be a little bit more specific with it, with the question. But often we hear doctors and surgeons telling um, patients after a, a procedure such as a discectomy or micro discectomy that they cannot lift or carry more than five kgs after surgery for a number of weeks. Um, and the patient is often told that it's due to compression. So knowing your research that you have done on calculating the internal um, musculature forces that, that the muscles actually create on the spine, what are your thoughts on this? Does it apply? And again, I know it's specific to each case, but what are your thoughts around uh, compression and, and lifting after, after uh, surgery? Will you allow me to go beyond compression? Absolutely, please do. To, to shear and bending and torsion and twist and all, all the modes of uh, potential loading. Well, let me go back to the St. Bernard and Greyhound. Are we talking about your grandmother, your wife, or your daughter? All of those people will have different answers to that question. Um, there are some procedures where they will nip out the extruded nucleus and they might put some, uh, now it's just escaping me, fibrin uh, into the delaminated part of the uh, collagen. Um, I would allow that to take hold for a little while but then allow the fibrin to adapt. So motion, a few cat and camels post-surgery. If that was why they had surgery, and if that was the surgical procedure, I would say that's probably a pretty good idea. I wouldn't load it heavily for a while. I would let that motion uh, and plug form in the uh, open fissure. Um, I don't know if I would give that answer uh, to the next person, but I'd be, uh, well, I, I have to take it on a, uh, just a case by case. Uh, what was the surgical procedure? What was the reason? And uh, uh, what's the base athleticism and robustness of the person, uh, et cetera, and go from there. Yeah. Uh, and again, you know, applying, applying the tool to the, to the purpose. I think that's a big one as well. If, yeah, my yeah. grandmother had the surgery and she just wanted to be able to get off and on the toilet and, you know, carry her groceries. That would be completely different to one of my uh, powerlifters who's trying to compete again and, and, and break uh, 
record. So again, context is key. So I appreciate you trying to, uh, without being too specific, trying to 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 talk about that topic as well. Um, yeah, but look at the number of patients that you get who've had uh, micro disc discectomies or whatever, and they say, "Oh, I reherniated. I had to go back and get a surgery." And I think, "What were you thinking?" Going back, I mean, that's what my brain says. Yeah, yeah. I don't say that to them, but you know, <laughs> what, 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 what could you have been thinking? That uh, did the surgeon not tell you? Oh no, they just said uh, rest for a week and go see a physical therapist. And what did the physical therapist do? Oh, and then they tell me what the physical therapist did, and they replicated the mechanism of the original injury. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, uh, it, you know, I, not I, all, by the way, I, no, I don't no, want to get uh, uh, taken the wrong way on that one. But uh, sometimes, yeah, for sure. And, you know, that's, again, coming, coming back to where identifying the mechanism, because I think that's where probably, you know, the system goes a little bit skewed in the fact that if they do head down the surgical route, they think that that's, you know, fixed and solved everything. And then they go back and as you uh, so thoroughly put it, pick at the scab again um, and then that causes a reherniation so actually educating them this is why your injury occurred um, and then giving them the tools so that they can actually you know build resiliency in their spine is is massive um, building on that point i think a great uh, a great question to ask and a great topic to discuss is specifically about the mcgill approach um, it's uh, m people may be aware of uh, mckenzie approach and different approaches out there and a lot of I think pain science um, around uh, floating around these days, but could you just speak to the McGill approach and how it is different to, to others? People will approach me and say, Oh, well, we used the McGill approach and it didn't work or we use the McGill approach and it worked. And I, and I think to myself, what on earth is the McGill approach? And they listen to someone on YouTube doing the bird dog, the side bridge and the curl up, which are known as the McGill big three. And they think that's the McGill approach. So they'll, they'll come and say, Oh, that, that didn't work for me. Or, Oh, wow. That really worked for me. And I think, well, that has nothing, very, very minor component of, of what the McGill approach would be. The McGill approach starts off with the assessment. The assessment is king. So we try and conduct a very thorough assessment to understand why the person has failed at the eight previous clinical attempts that they've already had by other clinicians. Um, what is it in their daily habits that cause these acute flare-ups? Because if I don't understand that, that, that will continue. Um, what are the very specific pain pathways and pain triggers? Uh, sometimes they might have two or three that we have to uh, unravel. Sometimes they're involving uh, neurodynamics and, and nerve root tensions or compressions or crushes. Sometimes it's uh, disc bulges. Sometimes it's stenosis, uh, not stenosis from a disc bulge, but I'm talking arthritic bone stenosis. Um, you know, it, it, it could be just posture. They've got muscular backache because they stand like this all day. And if I stood like that, or if I held a pound of butter in my hand, my bicep would be screaming at the end of the day, put down the pound of butter. Oh, my bicep got better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> stand, bring your hips forward and shut down the back muscles. Oh, doc, you're magical. You took the cramp out of my back. And I said, no, I didn't. I just shut the muscles down <laughs> by getting you to hover your ears and your shoulders over your hips so anyway the assessment is king when we started the experimental clinic at the university i set aside two hours to see a back pain patient it's all we did back pain and my other medical colleagues would say mcgill what are you going to do for two hours in a back pain clinic do you know after the first year, Jordan, we moved out to three hours because in some people, that's how thorough we had to be to investigate all of the things that were impacting on their life. So, you know, and then you use the word pain science. Well, I thought we'd been doing pain science for 30 years. Uh, we'd been listening to the patient's story. Some of them, we would listen for an hour about their job and their family and things that we had to deal with. You know, if, if a woman, if we said to that woman, we need you to walk four times a day for 10 minutes as part of your therapy. And then they, they in their conversation say, well, I can't do that because 
uh, I can't go out and walk after dinner in my neighborhood. It's too dangerous. Well, how many clinicians have you told that to before? Well, no one's ever asked. Well, if we can't deal with that impediment, what is going to be the uh, adherence to that thing that they need to do to get rid of their back pain? It's going to be zero. So, you know, I, I don't see it as, oh, there's McGill and McKenzie and pain science and all the rest of it. I see it as we conduct a very thorough investigation trying to understand their pain pathway. The next part of the McGill method, if you want to call it that, is to then take away the cause. So if it's the way they sit, the way they lift, uh, whatever it happens to be, can we give them a movement hack? Can I give someone with a herniated disc a way to tie their shoe by putting their foot up? Oh, and that's way too high, but nonetheless, put their foot up on a stool and then tie their shoe this way, not mimicking the cause of their uh, back pain. Or it might be simply postural in extension. An extension intolerant person will get out of the chair, they go into extension, and then, <laughs> in other words, they go right into the very thing that we just measured. Uh, took their pain away. So they don't need exercises or anything else. They need a new way, a new movement engram to get out of a chair. We might say, drop your chest a little bit and get out of the chair. But anyway, we try and give them movement hacks and life hacks to stop the cause. If they're an exercise addict, we'll do uh, behavior modification. <laughs> this isn't anything new. <laughs> and then, uh, we go into provocative testing to mechanically stress their tissues to see if we can replicate their pain. Once we replicate it, we know enough about what we just stressed so we can now hypothesize as to what the, the, the pain generators were. And then we apply the antidote, the mechanical opposite, to see if we can take their pain away. And if it was to add a bit more stability and stiffness and control, and that takes their pain away, bingo. We've just found the problem and the solution. And then the final part of it is to really understand what their goals are. And these days, people have far too, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, excessive goals in the weight room. Modern life is they don't do physical labor anymore in their life. The only time they do physical labor is when they go to the gym. And then they think, oh, they're not a real man or woman until they can lift a deadlift, double their body weight. Wait a second. <laughs> That's for very, very special uh, people. And they're actually shortening their athletic career by doing that. You know, it takes a, a few years of, of conditioning of the body plus very good uh, training technique to, to get the resilience to start deadlifting your double, uh, double your uh, body weight or triple or quadruple, what, as the case may be these days. But uh, my point is, that's the McGill method. And, yeah, uh, that's massive there. I think, uh, to, I guess to summarize it, I know that it sounds very simple, but it's so, so complex and there's so much into that, but it starts with a thorough, very, very detailed, thorough assessment, taking the time to actually understand the individual, um, and then from there, once you identify their, their pain triggers or their mechanisms, winding down that pain, once we've winded down that pain and allowed it to adapt and heal up, it's building resilience. Is that sort of the overarching, I guess, if I summarized it very simplistically into, into one sentence, would that be the, I guess, the approach, if you can put it as that? Yeah, you said, you should have answered because you did it better than me. <laughs> Uh, you've got to provide the, uh, like we said, the key, right? The co context is key. So, uh, so I, 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 I need you to be the McGill spokesman. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can say it better than me. I'm too close to this stuff. This is the problem. I, I have two, two of my, my top instructors, Ed Cambridge and Joel Proskovitz. And it's fabulous. They, they teach so much better than I because they're just one step removed from it and they get to the point me I blather on about details that I think of while we were doing this over the 35 years or whatever and all the little stories that pop into my mind that are totally irrelevant to most people so Brilliant. No, the, the more the better I love it I could talk about it all day um, so if we may I just wanted to touch on one controversial topic that that's out there and that's the core myth if I can put it that um, and what I'm specifically talking about is trying to draw your belly button towards your spine is what I often hear in, in, in clinic patients have been told by 
you know, therapists, uh, clinicians out there trying to draw their, their belly button towards their spine to activate their TA. Well, how on earth would transverse abdominis stabilize the spine? The spine is a rod. It needs a guy wire system. There's no question about that. But other muscles are much more effective. And we measured the role of pretty much every core muscle and its contribution to creating stability. And stability comes from the muscles being played like an orchestra. Depending on the activity, different muscle sequences create sufficient stiffness to allow the spine to bear the load successfully. Um, when you pull guy wires closer to a mast, it's easier to knock the mast over. In other words, it decreases stability. Um, if I did a walkout, so I don't know if you can say I did a walkout like this, and then I drew my abdominal wall up. I was demonstrating that to a group of uh, graduate students about 20 years ago and my spine buckled and I had really massive extension driven pain in the, my mid thoracic spine for about half a year afterwards. Stupid me. I should have pushed my abdominals out like a pregnant lady to, to move the guy wires away from the spine to create more stability. So pulling a muscle towards a joint is destabilizing. It's not stabilizing. But, you know, you have to ask the question, why on earth do we have transverse abdominis? Well, if I ingest poison and I need to vomit, guess what you use? Transverse abdominis. The first year in uni when you met Mr. Tequila for the first time and what was sore the next morning? transverse abdominis. So it's a, a muscle that helps you yell loudly. If you're an opera singer, I hope you have a good transverse abdominis. Uh, giving uh, birth, uh, going to the toilet, uh, you know, all of these things are all essential functions and, and assisted by transverse abdominis, but it's never been shown to be a uh, spine uh, stabilizer. Uh, I know it was shown to be perturbed in people with back pain in terms of initiation of onset. But scientists find what they look for. If that's what you look for, that's what you'll find. But, you know, I think of the studies done at Yale University on back pain to athletes, and they found all the muscles were screwed up <laughs> with pain, like Yonda showed and, and many others. So um, I think, you know, again, applying it to uh, function as well. Um, if we could just change tact a little bit and go to more of the rehab and performance side of, of things now. Um, so if we could touch on some of your non-negotiables, I know you've spoken about uh, the big three before. Um, so if you could just highlight those and, and why I guess you chose those big three or why they came to the top as being the most effective um, as your fundamental ones. Part of enhancing the ability of the human linkage to move I've gone through this before. The principle of proximal stability is non-negotiable. So the, the question then became, how do you build proximal core stability to allow you to walk, run, throw, push and pull and all the rest of it um, in a way that spares the spine? Because these people have back pain. Uh, you can't just choose any exercise you like and overload the spine that already has a reduced tipping point and a reduced capacity. So we looked at many exercises over the years, but we never found a single core exercise that was superior. We found some to challenge the front of the core, some to challenge the sides, and some to challenge the back. And the, the three that kept bubbling up to the surface was the bird dog for the back, the side plank, for the sides and the modified curl up where you put your hands under your low back and you just hover the head and shoulders just a couple of centimeters off the, the, the floor, so to speak, for the front. Well, then we learned how to progress each one of those basic big three exercises. So we could regress a bird dog for someone who's had knee replacement, for example. They can't get down on the floor, but they can stand at their kitchen table and do a bird dog uh, as you see like that, for example, someone who's damaged the rotator cuff can't do a side plank, so they might do a lateral leg hover. But nonetheless, uh, for people without these limitations, uh, the form of the big three is uh, they kept bubbling up, sparing the spine and ensuring the creation of engrams 
uh, muscle memory to uh, ensure sufficient stability and enhance performance. Then we found other things that we didn't quite anticipate. We would train Muay Thai fighters to kick hard, strike hard, punch, and all of these kinds of things. Core static isometric exercise increased the effective mass and the impact was harder. Dynamic core exercise increased closing velocity. So the speed, the speed that their fist traveled to the target or their foot traveled to the target. So uh, again, it depends on the nuance and the context, but there's a little bit of a start anyway about why virtually everybody benefits to some degree from a little enhancement of core stability. And we'll choose for most people, starting off with the big three, uh, for their core. But, you know, there's many other non-negotiables as well. As a human form, you have to walk. And many people don't walk. Uh, one of the best spine conditioners is is short walks throughout the day. Fantastic. And, and on that walking as well, is that due to the concept of cyclical compression for disc health? It can be, yes. There are some people with disc bulges, for example, and if they went for not a slow walk, that's static load, but uh, uh, a faster walk, swinging the arms about the shoulders to unload the spine using the elastics and walking over undulating ground like a golf course would be uh, uh, a very good example to assist many types of disc bulge, bulges actually reduce with that particular walking pattern. Well, that's, that's fascinating. And then you see the next person who's a power lifter, they're stiff through the arms and shoulders and their arm swing twists their spine. So do you see that whole concept has now just been lost? Where, uh, so do you see again, context is everything, but someone who, uh, you know, and walking with the joys of spring, they're loose in the shoulders. So they have a little bit more stiffness through the core, a little bit more laxity through the hips and the shoulders. They can now reduce the load on the spine as they walk and, and may very well, uh, there's a quite a very large subgroup of back pain people where they say sitting in a chair in the computer causes my back pain. Going for a walk takes it away. Walking is my therapy. If I could walk all day, I wouldn't have back pain. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Again, context is key. I love that. Fantastic. Um, and if we could just touch a little bit on, on cause I think it's so fascinating. It's one of my, um, real, uh, interesting things that you often talk about is your how you i guess came to 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 recognizing these as being some of the best uh exercises and that's that um your role or your consultation with the uh, i believe it's american defense force where they recruited you to have a look at their um, back pain uh service men and women so if you could just touch briefly on that and what how you sort of found uh, sit-ups and its relationship into that whole uh, uh situation well that started with the canadian military, not the Americans. The Americans picked it up later. It was the U.S. Navy that, that picked it up later. But uh, with the uh, Canadian military, uh, they had annual fitness tests and they were suspecting that some of the fitness tests were actually causing their back pain issues. So they uh, changed from doing speed sit-ups because the uh, infantrymen, the sailors, soldiers, we're, we're training speed setups every day to pass the test. And uh, they actually changed uh, a lot of those tasks to what would be called these days more functional tasks. You know, carry this from here to there, drag this body along, carry sad bags and, and these sorts of tasks. And in your book, uh, Low Back Disorders, which I've read numerous times and, and uh, really... It's, I guess that one's written for clinicians. So if you're a clinician out there, please go, go and get your hands on a copy if you can. It's fantastic. Um, and for the more lay public, um, looking at your other books like Back Mechanic as well. Um, but in that, you sort of talk about how one setup, I believe if I'm not mistaken, is about 3,400 newtons of, of pressure on the spine. Is that correct? Yeah, for the average man, yes. Um, very, very fascinating. And it's, again, testament to your career, how, how um, I guess you've touched on so many areas. Um, it's just fantastic to see. So I really, I really applaud you. Um, and finally... Well, if I, if I can say that, uh, Jordan, I'm not so concerned with a smaller person. 
if they have a virgin back and they have no back pain, uh, I'm not as concerned. But when I see a stouter boned person, a heavier skeletal frame, in other words, you take a big rugby prop, I wouldn't give them sit-ups. No way. That's a thick rod and they will head to trouble faster. That spine can bear much higher compressive loads than a slender spine. But sit-ups is the wrong way to train that particular kind of spine. But, you know, there's, there's a, a guy in Brazil on YouTube who just did 10,000 sit-ups. But do you think he's a slender spine or a thick spine? Big, strong fella. Surely he's got to be slender. Yeah, you don't even need to go see the video. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, again, it's, uh, it's all so context uh, specific. But military standards uh, do not allow for discrimination. Yeah, absolutely. Occupational standards do not allow for, for uh, discrimination. You cannot take a 60-year-old postal worker, female, who's about ready to retire and say that she has a lower work capacity than a 20-year-old young buck male full of testosterone. Government policy won't allow it. And yet they are one totally polar opposites in terms of physicality, the tipping point and everything else. One is inhibited by such low uh, exposure standards. The one that you're trying to protect in society, the older woman who's about ready to retire will not be protected. She's crossing her tipping point. It's interesting, isn't it? Completely, yeah. Context, again, you know, keeps rising to, to the top. Context is key. Um, so to, to finally wrap up, and, and um, I just wanted to close with two, I guess, more uh, personal, uh, if we can call it that, um, topics or questions to finish off on. And, and that would be if, if you were a, if you couldn't be a spinal expert or couldn't have the career that you did have, I'm interested to know, what, what would you have wanted to do? What, what career path would you have gone down? Well, when I was in high school, the uh, career counsellor, on parent night, told my father, I'm, I'm a waste of energy in, in high school. I should go to trade school. So I went to plumbing school. Right. And uh, I would have been quite happy being a, a plumber. I, I already knew a fair bit about that. I, I learned from my father and his friends. But uh, the high school football coach talked to me and said, come back to high school. And uh, I, there was a few university coaches that uh, wrote me letters, wrote my mother letters. And uh, th that's how I ended up in university. But it was a, a, a few university professors that it, when I was in high school, I had no idea uh, that I would ever understand mathematics and physics because the teacher would teach us something, you know, introductory calculus and whatnot. And it was just gobbledygook to me. I, I couldn't understand it. And I had no one to ask. I didn't have any mentors for uh, science and, and math and whatnot. But when I got to university, there were some university professors that they just unleashed the world to me in terms of science. And all of a sudden, I understood math isn't magic anymore it's it's pure mechanics it's just ways to manipulate forces and pressures and uh, electrons for electricity and all the rest so i now now having said that i never understood chemistry but physics and uh, engineering strength of materials it, it all suddenly opened up so i'm saying that in that i never had a, a career path or a thought other than in the trades it was just such good fortune that I ended up in university. Uh, I was the first person in my family to ever finish high school. And uh, to uh, get that exposure, and, and uh, I mean, I've never looked for a job in my life. Work has always found me. Uh, so I've, I've never really, I know I'm a terrible example, I guess. But, uh, you know, I, I never expected to see patients. Doctors asked me, would I come and see a patient with them? I, I, you know, I, I had no idea that I'd end up as a 65-year-old man having had this career. It was never anticipated. or uh, So it's a lousy answer. It's not what you expected, I'm sure. 
but that's uh, fantastic yeah. it's it's i think we're so incredibly lucky the world is that that you actually ended up going down this path not to say that you wouldn't have been a great plumber i'm sure you would have uh, done well in that as well um but i think the world, yeah. well all, all the other professors at the university uh you know some of my friends there would know this and they'd ask me to come over and fix their plugged up toilet <laughs> Fantastic. No, the world's definitely uh, very lucky to have you gone down the path that you have. Had. Um, and finally, to wrap up, final one, if you could go back to back in time to uh, young Professor McGill um, and, and get, could only give him one piece of advice, what would that piece of advice be? And I know it's quite an overarching uh, question as well, but uh, if we could relate it specifically back to, I guess, you know, back pain research in general and career that you did have, what would be your one piece of advice to a young Professor Stuart McGill? It would probably just be kinder. That's brilliant. I think that you know, the world needs, especially now in these days, needs a little bit more more of that. And we see it in, in you know clinicians, uh, patients coming in and actually having tears in, in the in the in the consult room. And I think that's you know such a fantastic thing to see, is you know because we it means that we're actually getting to to actually find out how meaningful it is to them and actually you know showing some compassion. So that's massive. What an answer! I m might not have said that twenty years ago. Wow, fantastic. What what experience and, and, and wisdom does to us, right? Um, so Professor McGill, wrap up there. Thank you so much for your for your uh, time today. I think everyone, myself included, would just be scratching our heads with how much is just in there. It's, it's been so rich and, and I appreciate the work that you've done um, over your career and, and continue to do as you consult um, out of Backfit Pro as well. So thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on this podcast and hopefully I haven't uh, taken too much of your time. So thank you very much, Professor McGill. Thank you, Jordan for uh, the conversation. I uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you.